Okay, hi everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Ellen, and I'm currently an intern here at Ilham Gallery. I just want to say thank you for coming to today's conversation titled The Local is an Alternate Reality. We are joined here today by writer Zedek Xu and visual artist Sharon Chin, who has exhibited at this gallery before. Um, they'll be talking about their <laughs> book, um, Creatures of Near Kingdoms, which was a result of a four-year-long collaboration and is available uh, to buy at our front desk. And the conversation will be moderated by Wang. Please enjoy. <laughs> Hello, um, good morning. Um, I'm replacing Sharad Kutan, who couldn't uh, make it this morning because of a personal situation. Uh, what we'd like to do first is show a video. Uh, it's just a few minutes, uh, and it's a way of uh, introducing um, Zedek and Sharon, uh, their location, as it were, right? Yeah. Okay, all right, um, go ahead. Hi, I'm Sharon. Hi, I'm Zedek. Um, he's a writer. Uh, Sharon's a visual artist. And we're here in our home in Port Dixon. Yeah, Port Dixon's just an hour outside KL. And these are ladies' fingers from our garden. We grew them. Actually, our gardener helped us grow them. Yeah, but it's nice to have them because they're big. And soon we will eat them. <laughs> I'm writing a book. Uh, it's a collection of 75 pieces of microfiction, so stories about uh, 100 to 200 words. Uh, and they are all descriptions of imaginary animals and plants uh, indigenous to Southeast Asia. I've been writing them in both English and Malay. Um, and they'll be illustrated by... What's the book called? Uh, the book is tentatively called Local Flora and Fauna. I'm not very imaginative. Okay, so I'm making the pictures for the book. Um, each story will be illustrated. So that's 45 animals and 30 plants. But actually it starts out as a sketch. So I rough out the sketch um, in the book like this. Uh, this is where it starts. I just sort of brainstorm ideas and then eventually develop it into a proper drawing. So this is the mud skipper. So once I have that, then um, I make a tracing of it so that I can trace it onto uh, the lino. So this is a kind of material that's made out of sawdust uh, and oil under great pressure, so it's, it almost feels like rubber. Um, it's very long-lasting. Um, so once I transfer the drawing onto the lino, um, I carve out the design with my tools. And these are my pride and joy. So I carve it all out, which takes a while, and um, covers the entire floor with little lino shavings. Uh, I found some in my underwear days after, so like it just gets everywhere, it's like glitter. Um, so um, once I've carved out the block, we call this uh, a block, um, I can then take a print. And uh, so I ink it up um, with the brayer. So I roll the ink on and then uh, I take a print. With, so I put a piece of paper on top of it and then we use what's called a baron and uh, so rub it and, and uh, like magic, you get it. Uh, yeah, so that kind of uh, explains how the lino cut art Hello. was made. Uh, and also where we live. Uh, that's our house in Bodixon. And that's it's kind of, the house kind of looks the same including all the mess on the floor. Uh, we'd like to show you some other images from our hometown. Yeah, so uh, these photos and the video were taken by our friends, Mark Nair and Carolyn Ui. Mark is a great spoken word poet from Singapore. You should check him out. 
and also a really cool photographer. So they came and visit us and um, we had to warn them beforehand, there's nothing much to do in Bodixen. <laughs> but there is a lot of there are a lot of abandoned buildings. So we brought them to one that's nearby our house. This was supposed to be a hotel. Uh, note, note how the edge of the building is, for, is built into the sea. Uh, yeah, so uh, Podixon has this thing I call the wasteland aesthetic. Uh, that's the beach uh, on Podixon. Oh, you should see inside the hotel. It's really amazing. Uh, there's a lot of graffiti inside. Um, a lot of it is explicit, naked bodies. Then you can actually climb up those stories of that, that block. Uh, anyway, here's our cat. Uh, she is the only piece of, well, only, only uh, example of wildlife that we have photographed uh, so well. Because the thing about taking photos of animals is that once they see that you're, I always am frustrated because I want to take a, I want to take a photo of an animal that has come to visit us and it runs away. Um, so yeah. She runs away whenever other people come to visit. Um, you, you were saying like it's living with her is like living with a wild animal. Ah yes, yes, because um, uh, yesterday um, uh, a friend of ours sort of w came to the gate and she jumped through the netting of our kitchen and ran out the backyard. Uh, she didn't even come into the house. She just heard the voices. Ah, uh, so this is a, let's see, it's a, meant to be a video. Uh, that requires some contextualization. So we live next to a school called SMK Dato Haji Abdul Samad, and um, they have assemblies every morning. And uh, the the tone is always the same. It's always scoldy. It's always shouty. This one in particular is interesting because here is the headmaster shouting at teachers uh, for not being at the assembly. When we say we live next to, that's our fence. So we actually share a fence so with the school. Imagine uh, that I'm here, I'm standing here, our bedroom window is here. So that's how close we are. <laughs> and, uh, and also, uh, we showed this video just to uh, remind ourselves and also you that we are, we're not living in paradise. So we face this every single morning. <laughs> um, let's move on. This is, uh, this is an evening scene. Um, it's, it's got a sound, there's the sound of a night jar. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's evenings. At, uh, this, th this was kind of, this was one of the videos we sent to Junkit, our designer, who designed the book and also uh, did the artwork for the cover, which is amazing. Thanks, Junkit. <laughs> yes, Junkit, Junkit. Um, yay! <laughs> we love you, we love you. <laughs> and uh, so this was one of the references that we sent to Jun. The other one is that. Explain that, please. This is also a video. Oh, really? Next to a school and next to a refinery. Refinery the is 200 meters away on the map. The refinery meters. is just beyond the school that you saw this. Like, that's the flare. It used to be the Shell Refinery Company. It's now called the Heng Yuan Sh Refining Company because Shell sold it to a Chinese company. Uh, they've been retooling it for the last two months. There's a constant whine in the air. Uh, uh, Sharon thinks it looks like uh, Mordor. Yeah, it is like living next to Mordor. Because of the, the sound especially, uh, the sound is quite new in the past couple of months. 
uh, it's very loud. It bothers me a lot. I don't know if it, yeah, it bothers me a lot. Is it a constant so sound? It's constant. It's nearly constant now. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a whine. It's just a low whine. Um, it's, it, it is noticeable, which mm -hmm. is very, like, I, I'm usually not bothered by sound, but yeah. Um, uh, here's something happy. Uh, Fort Dixon has these refineries and heavy sort of like industry, but uh, our friend... Two refineries in Fort Dixon. Yeah. Um, our friend Lina, who we met in Fort Dixon, works for the UPM uh, marine station there. And she identified this species of sea slug in the Bodixon waters. Uh, oh, we should say the name because it's an amazing name. It's the, it's Niche, the, the, yeah. the species. It's a Sacra, Sacra Proteus, I think, is the, is the genus. Yes, and mm -hmm. she, because uh, she discovered the sea slug, she wanted, uh, she gets to name it, and she wanted to name it after a Malaysian hero, and uh, it's named after Nisha Ayub. Yeah. So, uh, um, That's a sea slug in Polixen. How large is it? Uh, it's really tiny. Okay. It's like, like that. Um, it, it was undiscovered because it looked like something else. So that's... So it looks like seaweed. And it eats something called sea grapes. And so this, it's in the picture. You can't really see it. It's so well camouflaged. It's amazing. So, yeah. So I, re I remember when, so we, when we talk with Lina, uh, we, I remember one conversation we had at our place and it's, it is very, it is very good to talk to scientists, uh, good and hard to talk to scientists today because scientists have this approach. I find they, they don't gloss things over they sort of just tell you in a very straight manner what they have observed and studied. Uh, and when we talk to Lina, we ask her about climate change, about the survival of our species. I remember she was very fatalistic. It was like, yeah, there's nothing we can do. Yeah. Um, she, she said, um, it's too late. But, and when we heard that, <laughs> we, we just we were silent for a moment and, uh, but, she says that from a scientific point of view, uh, but it did not seem hopeless in a funny way. I, I, I don't know why. Um, before we continue, uh, Sharon asked me to remind everybody, because, you know, climate change, science, a wildcat, I was just thinking, um, we're being recorded, as you may have noticed, but we so take it for granted that every time you are at a public talk, you're recorded and, and everything like that. But Sharon also feels that it's important to sort of remind you that we are. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. carry on. Yeah. Surveillance state. Um, yeah. So that's Port Dixon, our home. Uh, that is two, an hour and a half away from KL. Um, and I grew up there. Uh, and the house you saw is the house I grew up in. Uh, I don't work there though, but Sharon does. Uh, so Sharon. So wait, 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 what did you just say? You don't. I don't work there. Okay. Uh, but Sharon works there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dixon was the. There was the recent by election yeah, yeah. that. Show them your finger. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, but how does that work? That that's your house and you don't. Because uh, I moved to KL and then. Ah, I yeah. Then you got registered. Yeah, and okay. I didn't change it back. Yeah. So anyway. Um, we, we wanted to start off with uh, these videos and images of Port Dixon because uh, we thought it's a really important place, it's really important, um, and how that, relates, uh, how that relates to the stuff in the book. And indeed, uh, the title of the talk is uh, The Local is an Alternate Reality. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we could talk a little bit about the process of the book. Um, and if any of you have any questions as we're discussing this, um, we do have a microphone. Uh, just raise your hand, jump in. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, let me start with a, a question. Uh, so you talk about how place is very, very important, but then when did this decision to do the book start taking place? I mean, start forming. 
Because the process was a few years, but I'm sure it, it had its germination even longer. Um, when we moved to KL, uh, that was... Uh, sorry, when we moved to Port Dickson, that was seven years ago. Uh, I, I had just been laid off and I wanted to work on a book. Uh, but I didn't know what. So it... You wanted to be a writer. Writer. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> so the... You move away thinking that you, you've got stories that you want to write and then it turns out that you don't. Uh, so what ended up happening was I was frustrated so I started writing about things around me and invariably um, living in Port Dickson, you're you're surrounded by... We've got frogs in our house that we don't know come from where and go to where, but they are constantly hopping across the floor. Do you find them in your shoes? Uh, they, we, once or twice, they like to be in the cat's water bowl. They live in the house. The frogs live in the house. Yeah. At first there was one, so we called it Mr. Frog, but then there were many. Eventually, there were, there were many. There are also like bats nesting in the eaves and... Um, sort of musang and monkeys and, you know, like monitor lizards kind of scratching at your window, like, like sort of a front window. Um, so, yeah, I started writing about that and those became the sort of pieces of text that are in the book. But are all the creatures in the book fantastical? Uh, they are all, yeah, I, I guess, yeah. They're all, I, I guess the, trendy word is e-rail. Uh, is what? Yeah, e-rail. E That's a trendy word, isn't it? I don't know. Um, what, what? No, no, okay, well, I okay, don't so, know that word. What so is yes, it? They, are, they are fantastical, yes. But what was that word? <laughs> I don't know, I see it used all the, like, I see, I see it used when people don't want to say fantasy or science uh -huh, fiction. I see. How do you spell it? I-R-rail. Oh, yeah. I real wow i real i real yeah. So, yeah yeah like not surreal e real yeah i see ah so this guy wow wow <laughs> <laughs> anyway um yeah so does that you would but no but but the 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 fantasy is only a departure as opposed to um I mean, of course, all fantasy is departure in that sense, but it does seem that that process is also very very grounded in observation i think. Well, I, um, we can get into that a little bit later, but I do want to talk about the idea that um, I have this theory that, I don't know how much is a theory, but uh, me and a uh, person I collaborate with a lot, Mankao, have talked about this quite a lot. Uh, the idea that, and also to Sharon, uh, the idea that um, the supernatural in this part of the world, or at least in our context or in our society, is a kind of realist fiction. Uh, or like telling supernatural stories is a realist fiction. So I, 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 that, that's related to that, that grounded sort of sense of the fantastic. So it's not, there is, when it comes to genre fiction in the West, it's always a kind of, oh, it's uncanny, uh, uh, it's surreal. I don't think that sense is present in the way we daily relate to. Would you feel um, an interesting, I'm trying to find the word of, of um, similarity or association with like magical realism? I'm not sure. I, I think I'm, I'm not entirely certain what the definition of magic realism is, but I think there is still the element of like it's a, it's a taking of a, a realistic situation and like a sort of like making it uncanny or like go departing from it. Whereas I think um, like magic here is not a departure. Uh, maybe um, and uh, maybe approaching it through the art could be a way to illustrate this idea because one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of um, visual culture here is the idea of flatness. 
uh, you take batik design, for example, and you even if you look at uh, Latif's works, especially these Pago Pago works, um, this idea of the flat. So everything is inhabiting the same picture plane. Uh, it's it's not perspective driven, so there's no illusion of depth in the picture plane. So on a batik design, for example, I've seen uh, batik, it's called batik dongeng uh, from Indonesia, and they depict European fairy tales. Uh, for example, Little Red Riding Hood, but Little Red Riding Hood is depicted on one sheet of batik. So uh, you don't read the story begin beginning, middle and end, you look at the story all at once. Um, and maybe this is a way also to talk about what you're saying, which is that magic and reality um, sort of inhabit this same plane, the same field, uh, just as uh, the human animals and uh, non-human animals inhabit the same environment. Um, I, so an, another thing, I, I guess we can only talk in anecdotes because I'm not a very... Uh, uh, is uh, Sharon recently was contacted by a friend who runs a like homestay space, saying like, oh, can we, uh, can we get one of our prints for our space? And then Sharon sent her an image of the of the lino print, and he said, oh, got snake, cannot. Uh, and and then our friend very self consciously said, uh, you 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 can laugh about it, but you know it's still we still can't have snakes. I think that's a kind of awareness about how. Um, you know, you. Uh, there, there, there's a quote I'm reminded of of an article whose title I can't remember, but it basically quotes like a, like a East Malaysian sort of like a, um, an East Malaysian interviewee saying like, "Oh, we are here back for the Harvest Festival, but we won't sleep in the longhouse because that's where the uh, the ancestor spirits are." and if we sleep there, they will, they will disturb us because they're angry we don't believe in, the, in them anymore because we're Christian now. Um, I think that's a... Uh, in, it, that relates to... That, that kind of sort of encapsulates what, what I feel or what I've come to observe is the way uh, this culture or our society relates to the supernatural. And I think that kind of approaches this idea of, you know, um, uh, are the animals real mm -hmm. in the book? Because that's mm -hmm. a question that, or a comment rather, mm -hmm. that we've been getting a lot of. Um, like half, half of the comments we've been getting are, oh, I thought they were real, or I could believe that they were real, or... Oh, I thought I knew this already, you know, it's like forms of knowledge that you, what, you, you only knew that you knew once you read it. You know, and some songs, folk songs, for example, operate that way. I've known this song all my life, but I didn't know, it, know that until uh, the, the moment I heard it. But also, even if, let's say, one could uh, imagine a reader, and the reader says, oh, you know, this sounds so familiar. And let's hypothetically say, well, actually, it isn't. That person never, never heard this. But somehow, the form of the story, that's also a part of it, right? The, the, there's that sense of the familiar. So the form is almost familiar more than, let's say, sometimes the content. People might be responding to that. And, and that sort of you know, talks about the, the kind of world that you're also talking about, right? You know, uh, a world where um, you know, all kinds of all, all these kinds of connections are there so that when you feel the almost like uh, a certain kind of edge of a connection, then you sort of make it, even though you don't necessarily have something of your own past that connects with it. Um, regarding the form, I suppose that's, that's, uh, that's possible because I mean, the book is obviously a callback to naturalist sort of like guides and like things, things like that. But, but there's also an element of, um, it, so, so thinking about the writing, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, ask another question following up about how the writing and the image making are, are related. But thinking about the writing, you know, a sto there's a very sort of descriptive sense that you're talking about a creature and you, you really give that kind of information. But there's also in terms of the rhythm of the language that it's almost like, uh, this would be a story that, let's say, a parent would tell a child. So it isn't as if you're the scientist out, you know, writing reports. 
Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. Uh, because you also folded in a lot of um, folk tales, uh, Skeet's Malay Magic. Ah, yes. Is a yes. book was what was a so reference some of for the, you? Some of the, like one or two of the animals are basically retellings of things recorded in Skeet's uh, Malay Magic. Um, so yes, there is there is that kind of. Um, I guess what you're what you're saying about the the weaving in of other sort of poetic. I have a question about that. So, like you, um, it's a question. I guess it, the conversation is kind of cl about how, why, why do you feel do you feel okay about retelling these tales? You know, there's this idea of like there's something about. Um, traditions or tales that is like absolute, you know, you can't, it's like, you can't take that. Uh, but people do take it, uh, they, uh, they appropriate it, but in this case, uh, they're, they're, so are there ways to relate to what is already there or what has been there uh, in a non-appropriative, non colonial way i think uh, like because uh, when i was writing some of these stories i asked actually i asked sharon oh do i have to attribute skip um uh, so i remember that conversation happening i think um how i made my peace with it is that yeah he doesn't really attribute the people he's taking the stories from uh but um but also i think i'm okay with it now because uh, these are these are kind of stories that you sh that are that are kind of present in our culture. It's just that we don't quite see it in certain parts of our culture. For example, one of the stories, the dog story in the book, is uh, references uh, um, the story of the the huntsman, the the huntsman ghost, uh, Hantu Pemburu. And I, 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 one of the books we picked up like three days ago from the Bargain Bin, that book had, uh, uh, was in part of, the no part of that novel, that Malay language novel was like, uh, oh, my, my nenet used to tell me this story about the Hantapumburu and I was very scared about it. So I think, um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, it's, it's a thorny subject. It's not something that, uh, there's an answer to. I think it's about a relationship. Yeah. You know, how does one relate to those tales? Uh, are you... I, I see myself like sort of, are we in the flow, you know, the same flow of those tales are? Um, i give you an example. <laughs> um, a few, a couple of months ago, uh, I had a waking dream of um, a Datuk Kong. Um, and it was a Datuk Kong that was for LGBT people in this country, LGBTQ people in this country. So Datuk Kong is a protective spirit of the land. Um, and traditionally, uh, it would, uh, the Datuk Kong would appear in the dreams of people who are living in that place. And then the people would then build a shrine to the Datuk Kong. Um, and uh, this question of whether this waking dream was a form of the Datuk Kong, so the, for, the, the, the Datuk Kong is trying to find forms uh, that are available to them, is one way that I've been thinking about it. So, uh, for example, me having had that waking dream, I told you about it, um, and stole it. No, you didn't steal it. You you wrote the story about it. You wrote you wrote the story into being, so you made it come into being. And I remember when you when you um, when you sent me the story, it was it was a it was a the f the feeling wasn't that oh we we are going to make a story about a Datuk Kong that's about LGBTQ issues. It wasn't like that. It was the direction of, 
um, the we are I, I felt that we are more the channels for the form. So uh, the thing wants to come into being. That's why the images occur. And we then, you rise to the occasion or you don't. You know, there, there is that aspect of it as well. Are you able to rise to the occasion of these signals or forms that want to come into being? Uh, and I remember, Telling you when you sent me the, the the story, I was this is this is it. This is good. It's. I'd, I'd like to go back to a word you said. You know, like living in the flow of it. So if you, but, but, what I also hear is um, there's a certain kind of security about living in the flow. There isn't this over anxiousness of of you know is this my place? Is this my culture? You know, do I need to defend it? Because you don't have an introduction to the book. You just sort of dive in into this world. Um, and I think that is also an expression of that, rather than feeling that you need to frame and bracket and then explain it, you just, the world is given in that way. Yes, uh, it takes, I think what's crucial here is the question of time, uh, because this relationship takes a long time to inhabit. Uh, for example, I, I would feel like in terms of, oh, can I, you, because these are not things to be messed around with. For example, like Tatokong is a serious matter. You see them everywhere. They are real. <laughs> so would I make a shrine to uh, this image that, that I have? Uh, that is on me to do. Um, it's, it's not so much a choice as in, it's a, it, it is a decision, I suppose. Uh, but it is related to flow, mm -hmm. about what wants to come into being, you know? Um, I don't know. I also, I mean, you, you talk about that kind of trust and relationship, you know, to a world, but also this was a collaboration. So if we could talk a little bit about how um, that, that kind of process of putting word, you know, putting down words and then uh, sort of visualizing them as well, or, you know, the, the, the story. So how did that work? Um. So, when I started writing the stories, I, um, I, I wrote all of them, and then I said, oh, I want, uh, I gave them to Sharon, basically. I, I'm not sure whether I even had the conscious thought of like, um, oh, I want somebody to illustrate these, these things. So I just passed them off to her, and she started drawing them. Well, do, I, well do, I, uh, do, am I remembering wrong? Okay, I, I remember you. So when we first moved to Podixon, you, 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 wanted, you, you wanted a book. Like the, the form of the book was very important to you. So you actually wrote a whole book. Like before this book, you wrote a whole book of story. Like how many hundred thousand, hundred, a hundred thousand words was it that you wrote? No, well, uh, this is the first book collection well, of stories. It was stories. also like a sh bits of short fiction. So yeah, it was a hundred. Hundred stories. It was a hundred stories. He wrote a hundred stories before uh, this book. They were all longer than these two, so it's like yeah. I've wasted everything. Yeah. So it was in in, but in many ways it was almost as if like you you had to write those hundred stories before you were writing these these particular stories, which came out like you were posting them to Facebook. I remember they weren't even. Oh, I'm gonna make a book. It was it was really. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're friends with me on Facebook, you might have re read the book already. Uh, yeah. Um, so yes, uh, we. Uh, I wrote the stories, and then you started making the images, and um, the images were the animals first. Mm -hmm. So, shall I uh, show yes. uh, two? So this is a show we did in 2016 in Penang. Uh, called uh, Local Fauna in Progress. Um, so that happened in Rana Mok, uh, uh, sort of space slash collective in Penang, uh, run by uh, very like uh, Fan Chun and Trevor at the time. Uh, and this was, when was this? This was 2016, yeah. Um, 
we, well, it, it, it just took so long to finish the art, so we had to do it in, well, I had to do it in, in stages. Um, and uh, this show is the first 20 Lino cuts that we made. And uh, as I was telling you, Wang, um, in many ways, my participation in the art world helped to subsidize the baking of the book, subsidize the time required to make the book. So, you know, we sold some prints, which uh, gave us another, like a year maybe, for that money? Um, yeah, I think um, we, we thought a lot about money with regards to this show. Uh, money and circulation, so circulation yeah. of value. So the idea was, uh, we thought about the form of the art a lot. Um, the idea that there would be many uh, copies and they would be affordable so the, f the, the images could circulate. Uh, and also a way to both make them affordable to our friends and also um, uh, a col appealing to collectors. Um, yeah. So the, yeah, so the, the each of the prints were like 300 ringgit, uh, but there were 20 of them, you see, so you could have the whole set. Um, and they were catch and carry, so you see the stuff hanging, ah. <laughs> you know, you could, as soon as you got one, you, you took it away. Um, and we also, we also talk consciously about Run Amok and our relationship with them and also making it worthwhile for them to work with us. Yeah, so it's that idea of art as, uh, I mean, we, we make art, it's, we, are, we, are, we actually want to circulate value uh, as opposed to accumulate. So artworks, uh, this is an idea from Douglas Rushkoff, uh, he's a media theorist who I really like. So he talks about um, reprogramming ourselves and the economy so that we, 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 we are more biased towards the velocity of, the, so the circulation of value as opposed to accumulating value. So um, this idea of if there's a high volume of trade going on, uh, that's, that's what we want, you know, to keep the money and value constantly circulating as widely as possible. Uh, so it, like, it was during this show that it really, really uh, solidified for me that the book can't be a hardcover. Um, so yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, we were, Sharon um, thought it was very important to have a space where people could sit down and do stuff. So that's why there's a table in the middle of the space. Sharon, do you feel um, that your drawing, uh, that your illustrations change the book? That Zedek would then start rewriting it? Um, I'm asking you the question rather than him. Not really, no. It, it, was, it was kind of a... Uh, there were many things that I thought about. Chief among them was probably money. Yeah, so how are we gonna... How are we gonna make this happen? How are we gonna make this book happen, you know? And uh, by using what we, uh, what, what we have or what I can do, um, so that was one of the considerations in terms of the form, like why these lino cuts? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the lino cuts came first. I made the patterns afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, one thing about the, the, the lino cuts is that, I've told this story many times, um, is that when, actually I didn't know how to draw. Went to art school, never learned to draw. True story. <laughs> Uh, I majored in sculpture, but still, you should learn how to draw. Uh, so I, I uh, in art school, it was I approached art from a conceptual point of view. It was good. I mean, it's very good grounding. Um, grounding. Well, I'm able to talk about art in a certain way, in a certain language. But um, moving to Podixon had to unlearn that in many ways, because whenever I spoke to locals there, and I said, oh, I'm an artist, and then they immediately have, oh, can you draw me? Yeah. Oh, can you, can you draw this, can you draw that? And I'm like, oh, I can't. <laughs> but 
um, I thought I better learn. So this long, long project is like uh, drawing intensive, you know? Well, uh, an, an anecdote to add to that is that like for the past two days, Sharon has been basically making a timetable for her local gym because you are the the graphic the most graphical person in the gym, so, so yeah, it's, it's serving about, a function in about, your community. It's about social function of art and artists, you know, um, in different spaces, uh, in this space and also in Bodixson. What do they what do they need from me, and what do they want from me, and how can I give what is needed and wanted? Um, on that note, could I invite uh, questions, if there are any, from the audience? Ray, you want to ask a question? Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, really wonderful. Uh, dialogue. Um, it, it's really quite delightful. Thank and you. I, I, I love the way that you're um, interweaving um, different types of ecologies. So you start, I mean, when I came in, sorry, I missed the, the, the first part on Port Dixon, uh, but you were talking about global warming and, and, and that issue and working with scientists. And, and so, so that notion of ecology, which is a very large notion of ecology of the earth, and of the planet. And then talking about these value systems and the circulation of art as, as a value system within, uh, within other economies. And, and those economies are an ecology as well. And, and, and uh, I think the word ecology has now been um, taken to um, include the Anthropocene, the, the, what humans bring uh, to um, uh, other ecologies. So, um, but, but um, then I was very fascinated. Sorry, I'm just going to roll for a little bit here. Um, um, then I was fascinated by the, the you know, you brought in uh, ghosts and, and, and spirits and, um, and, and that ecology. It's an entirely different community, right? Uh, Hantu Bunian, uh, or, or what, whatever, you, you know, you're, you're, um, you're, I haven't read the book yet, so I don't know what's actually in there. But, but um, I saw a trashy um, uh, zombie movie a few days ago, a Korean one, Rampant, uh, which um, uh, is, you know, incredibly bloody and, and, and horrible, horrible, um, but really fascinating at the same time, because it's a translation from one... Um, uh, culture to another of, of a particular meme, which is the zombie, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and how this notion of the dead as this pile of bodies from the past, this pile of spirits from the past, then inhabits us now. Uh, but, the, but the possibility of global warming actually brings the, the dead into the future. You know, and it's, it's us, uh, you know, us as zombies of the future uh, returning back to us. So, so um, yeah, I'm just really interested in how you feel the, this underlying kind of infrasound that we all hear now of global warming, of the degradation of the total environment and survival of species. Uh, and the great extinction that we are causing as a species, um, how that then affects your work uh, at the local uh, and, and in, in, the, in the works that you're doing now as a kind of ontology of the future, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, the way I respond to that is the Uh, I think even after the apocalypse, uh, people will need stories. Um, so that's how I feel about what I'm doing. Um, that the, you know, this this idea of uh, the inevitability of the end. Um, well, like, what do we do between now, that realization or whatever, and the end itself, and even after the end? 
We have to remember that there are some people, many people on Earth who have already experienced the apocalypse. Black people. People in Latin America. It's, they've, and they live, and they thrive today. So that's proof. Uh, and also it's a way, I mean, if you want to talk about the future, I think I'm going to follow that future. Yeah. I think it's kind of the sense that we got when we were talking to that uh, scientist friend of ours, Lina. Because um, like, it's inevitable, but you know, you still got to... What are you going to do now? Uh, is the thing that she was reminding us of. Uh, yeah. Should we... Because we've got a few more slides. Yeah, please, sh please show that, and then I'll take your question. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was... So that was 2016. The, the, that supported us until 2017 when Sharon had to do another show. Uh, oh, okay, so um, here's an opportunity to talk about how Sharon's pattern designs worked. Uh, the, the 25 plant stories are fabric pattern designs. So this was how she made them. Can you, do you want to speak as I sort of thumb through? Yeah, I'll, I'll just talk very quickly about the patterns. Um, so the patterns in the book are actually functional. They are, if you, you can join them up and they, uh, they function as real patterns. So you can put them on batik. Uh, um, and this is the process of composing the patterns. So it's about rhythm. Uh, this pattern is on a bag. I know somewhere. Somebody has this on, the, on her bag. So the, making the patterns was, uh, it was a revelation for me. It really feel, it felt like music. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, you, there's a, such a thing as a rhythm in your eye because uh, some patterns are about water um, and those have a completely different feel from other patterns. So that, that was pretty trippy to discover, you know? Um, this joy of the repetition and Again, how you Mordor. can compose. Again, <laughs> Mordor. <laughs> yeah, Mordor also sir, uh, resonates with uh, Ray's comment. You live in the shadow of Mordor. So uh, a show of these, uh, the, a show of these patterns, oh, so this is Bogus merchandise. Um, two friends, uh, they are a screen printing collective and I uh, collaborated with them on a show in 2017. It was shown in Singapore, which I really regret because these, the full experience of these pattern works has not been seen in Malaysia. Um, so you, these are the, this was the installation. So it's all 25 patterns screen printed on used fabrics. Uh, so This yes. is our bed sheet. I lost one of my sarongs to this show. Yeah, <laughs> you sar thank you. <laughs> but but uh, you make us money, so it's okay. <laughs> um, so uh, this, again, uh, circling back to this idea of can you put something on something that's already there? In this case, existing patterns, existing um, material without it being uh, without dominating it, without taking away from what's already there. So it's in a conversation. So the, the used fabrics, uh, they, they make the pattern that's been put on top as, and the, the pattern that's been put on top is also making, it's, it's, it's making a new thing, basically. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I, well, I had a hard time getting people to understand this. I really had a hard time. Um, yeah. I've, I've so that was uh, local flora in progress. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, could we take your question yeah. then? Yes. Okay. Thank you, hi. Uh, Sharon and Zedek, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the dialogue so far. I guess my question right now is for Zedek, because you mentioned that's your childhood home. Um, and you've lived there, you grew up in Port Dixon in the 80s and 90s, I presume. I, I am interested in what your thoughts are, like you've seen the changes and you've, you've grew up in Port Dixon, you've come and go, you know, you lived in KL. And I don't, could you tell us more about your childhood and what Port Dixon was like and how has that 
also inspired the work and the stories that you've done? Because I'm interested in refinery, for example. Like, was it always there when you were growing up? Um, the, the, the abandoned hotels, when did that start coming up? Was Port Dixon ever sort of going up or, you know, or was it always been the town that most Malaysians sort of associated, you know, in terms of sort of not sort of a ghost town? Um, Thank you. When, uh, when I was growing up, uh, the crash happened. So when I was 10, it was 97, and all these hotels which were built during the era suddenly stopped. Um, so there's definitely the sense of like things stalling, uh, projects being half finished. Um, the the school, both the school and our, re, both the school and the refinery expanded as I was growing up. So I remember the our backyard being jungle, and then the school started encroaching, and then Shell Refinery expanded. So like both those elements uh, moved into view. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know whether that answers your question. I'm, uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, we actually live across the street from Simran Gill, who is a visual artist uh, and whose family has lived in Podixon since the very beginning. So she, it's interesting to talk to her and ask. And so she, by talking to her, we, um, I got the sense of the history that came before me. Um, so like the, the way that there was a pub, sort of public field that everybody used in town that was uh, removed during the 80s, the 70s and 80s after, after the race riots. Um, so this is that kind of thing. I'm, I don't have a comment about what those changes mean necessarily. I think they speak for themselves. Um, yeah, um, Sharon is Sharon now lives in Podix, and, and it's also interesting to talk to her and see what it means to her, uh, being having been born in KL and then moved to moved away from the center. Sharon, when was the first time you went to Port Dixon? As a kid in the 80s, yeah, parents, I think many Malaysian kids who grew up in the 80s probably went to Port Dixon, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you did already have frames of reference before you actually lived there? Yes, I have strong memories of Ming Kot, the hotel. Yeah, <laughs> it's abandoned now. It's yeah. Um, Hmm. Well, just in the short time that we've lived there together, so since 2011, the refinery, it's gotten bigger. Yeah. So uh, definitely, well, I, I have a sense, not so much of peril as in, oh, I might want to prepare myself. Like I've been talking, I keep on mentioning, I mentioned it a lot this year, right? I said, I want to get an air quality tester kit because I feel uh, we will need that data in the near future. So uh, I, I need to do that now. Because, so, you know, it's, it's sort of, they're not going to go away. <laughs> the refinery's not going to go away. And so we are living there. And, something you know, it's going to come to it. Something that occurs to me when you talk about that, that is that um, this image of, you know, the, the frog in the pot being boiled, uh, but it's not only just the refinery and us, it's also like, because our friend, uh, we, we have a Bodixon friend who works at the refinery as a contract worker, and um, because of the crash of the petroleum, uh, petrogas crash in like a f few years ago, um, she's really felt imperiled if I, uh, economically. So, but it's a slow process of like, oh, so now they have stopped giving us so much over time, or now they've stopped over time altogether. So it sort of progresses in stages. I think um, that's, that's something to be aware of. What about some of the local activism in Port Dixon? We haven't experienced any. Um, not not that I'm, I've ever been aware of having lived there, like, uh, what activism. Um. But we have heard 
Simran has mentioned a residence association existed for a long time. So the institutions, like not just in Podikson, I mean, this applies across the country, the institutions are there. It's that how does one um, re-inhabit them? And it's a long process. It takes time. Other questions or comments or, yes. Can I ask a question? Um, <laughs> I was wondering actually like if you ever had like, what kind of like audience you had in mind when you were writing the book? Like, cause you say it's like a very, like it's a very localized book, right? So I was wondering if like maybe consciously or unconsciously you were, you were like, did you ever think about like an international audience or not or? Writing it, I was very conscious that I, 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 I write in the English language and um, the people who live in my town wouldn't uh, necessarily read a book in English. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been kind of a point of concern. That's why in the video at the very beginning you saw, like you saw me say that I, I wrote the stories in English and Malay and yes, there is a Malay language version, it's just that when we, um, when we spoke to publishers about it like, and, they, uh, and I asked them, can we do a bilingual volume? It's like, no man, don't be, don't be dumb. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're, we want, we... We do really want to. And uh, they might, they might. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, to... They said maybe. They did yeah. say maybe. It's we'll see how it goes, they said. No, because it's awkward. It's awkward to... It's hard to... It's easier to do it in in the English language book and the Malay language book as separate. I, 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 tell a, I tell a little story about, well not story, but we were just talking about it this morning, about, um, so the book has been circulating a lot in KL uh, and in certain spaces um, and been getting really good response. Now the book, I've yet to show the book to my friends uh, in Podixon. And it's not an easy matter. It is more complicated than one might imagine. Uh, because it's not just a case of giving the book out. Here, we made a book, here, take one, take one. Uh, in fact, there's, uh, we, we, had, we had to get our pipes fixed yesterday. And uh, Atai, uh, who, <laughs> Comes to, who, who comes to do our uh, wiring and also plumbing, um, I said, hey, we have a book. And uh, he, it was, there was a sense of, congratulations, that's amazing, he said. Uh, he said, congratulations. But, but also, he, he, wouldn't, he didn't want to touch the book. Yeah, he there, was very... There was a fear. There was a fear about it. Uh, and he's like, oh, which means I, I, I don't read. Yeah. Uh, then I said, got picture, got picture. <laughs> and he's like, ah, good, good, good. Um, <laughs> nah. Um, so it, it, uh, the, the question of, now this book is, comes from Port Dixon. There's no doubt about that. It comes from us living in Port Dixon. Without us living in Port Dixon, it, it, we wouldn't be able to make this book. Now, how can it return? The question of the artwork returning to the place that it came from is not an easy matter. So uh, w one of the things that I was thinking about uh, in terms of, um, like I, if I give uh, this book to the people in my gym, for example, uh, because that's, that's a community that I have there. And, and, um, and I say, uh, oh, here, please have a look at it. Uh, we hope to have a Malay version later on. And maybe when we come up with that, then you can buy it. So there's a, there's a sense of, there's an, uh, ongoingness, you know, um, it, it, it takes doing is what I'm trying to say. I also want to sort of like acknowledge the, our publisher, Maple Comics. I, it's, it's strange for them to publish a book like this. Uh, but it was, it, in as much as it's strange for us to work with them, I think that was, it was really cool that they said yes. Uh, and approaching them was really part of 
the result of us thinking about this a lot, uh, because they told us, look, you want to sell your book to people generally, it has to be 20 bucks. Um, that's why the book is 20 bucks. So it can go both in these sort of gallery spaces or our friends, amongst our friends, but also uh, to the book fairs and the things like that. Um, yeah. For instance, you were recently at an Arts for Grab selling it, and it's available today here uh, for 20 ringgit. Yes, please. Um, another commenter question. Um, you and then Chitu. Hi, um, how many publishers did you approach before they signed you up? Um, I, I actually, it was, it was actually very, I think three, uh, and Maple being the third, because I kind of, by the first two already, you could sort of tell that people were going, what the, what the hell are you doing? And even if you want to do this, make it a hardcover coffee table thing. You know, that, that makes the most sense because it's uh, Sharon's a visual artist. She's, she, she, I think people, like Sharon got really annoyed. At, that was frustrating. That was so frustrating. Um, yeah, so thankfully, I, I know my play. I know the guys behind my play from uh, a while back. And they were, uh, they actually published a very, uh, an unusual book Previously, before this, uh, was Ami Hafizi's um, memoir about his father, which was also a kind of like text and image book. So I thought, oh, you know, they do strange things like this, so why would they say no to us? So. Um, and responding to what she was asking just now, um, I'm, I'm actually in the middle of reading your book right now, and I also had the pleasure yesterday of leafing through a very old edition of one of Skeet's book on pagan cultures and people in Malaya. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's, it's kind of same, same, but different kind of situation in the sense where you're describing things. So in terms of whether it has a, a reach beyond Malaysia, I, 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 I kind of feel like I've, I read those two books in the same vein where I, things are just being described to me. So, yeah. Um, secondly, <laughs> going back to the whole, this whole thing about global warming and, and, and you raise a good point um, because this is something that's been bugging me for the longest time. Um, I, I do have that fatalistic view that it is too late and what do we do now? And I, I think I want to propose that maybe we should stop looking at global warming as an environmental concern, but more as a social justice concern. Um, why I say that is because, um, like it or not, everything's going to be shit eventually. And the problem right now is that the people suffering the most from this contributed the least to this problem. And I think what we need to do is to, we need to find ways to help these vulnerable communities to mitigate the sort of problems of global warming. I mean, for example, um, Pacific Islanders who have nothing to do with global warming are losing their homes to rising sea levels. Um, people living in Africa, for example, are not their crops are failing because of global warming. They, they, they've got nothing to do with this. So I'm thinking, like, as as we come to an end, how do we, how do we make sure that everyone is sort of able to get through this, yeah, and not just the rich first world, second world countries who can shelter ourselves from the effects of this destruction. Yep. Uh, I. Uh, two things come to mind for me. Uh, one is uh, China Myville in one of his keynote addresses somewhere. I can't remember where. Uh, he's a fantasy writer. Uh, made a comment about how it's easier to re-engineer our entire environment because it, this was a keynote address to like a sort of like 
ecological sort of seminar or like sort of conference or whatever and like people were talking about oh putting sun shields on to like cool the earth or whatever so he made a he made an observation that it's easier to change the earth than to change uh, global capitalism or the way we function in global capitalism so that's the first thing uh, the second thing is I think um, you're right in that there are cultures who, or there, there, there are people for whom uh, there are societies which are suffering that are, uh, who didn't really have a guiding hand in this catastrophe. Um, in in a small way, I think that's what our our departure from the center is about. For me personally, like, at least, um, is to because the problem of this this thing is very much accelerated by a centralized uh, we love centers that decide things so all the, all the mega industries are all administrated from a center so the departing from that idea of the the, the international or the, even the national uh, to, the, to the place where we are it feels very important to me um, and it feels like that's a that's a valid strategy to deal with what's what we're facing I don't know why I thought about um, I thought about this interview that Solange uh, one of my favorite artists singers uh, she's uh, really really brilliant artist. I learned so much from her work. Um, I thought of an anecdote when you were talking about the end, this question of the end. And uh, it's about, um, she was on one of, uh, she was uh, sh shooting one of her music videos, Don't Touch My Hair. Uh, and uh, it was being shot by her husband, Alex Ferguson. Um, and uh, the, the light was going, so they had assembled all these dancers on the steps of, I'm not sure, quite sure where the location was, but the light was going. And um, you know, that's when you're on shoot, when the light goes, you're like, oh, you know, you start panicking. And, um, but her husband, the, the, uh, Alex Ferguson said, uh, the light is just beginning. Nothing is, the light is not ending, it's just beginning. So let's carry on with our shoot. And if you see that particular scene that he's talking about, it is, it, the light is very low, but it is glorious. Um, so that's one thing that I thought about, about the end. Um. <laughs> I, I, as you, I got, uh, another thing that I wanted to tack on is um, Ursula Le Guin, one of Ursula Le Guin's uh, most beautiful books, uh, called Always Coming Home is about a society in the California that has been destroyed. Um, it's very pretty. It's, it's a post-apocalyptic novel, but it's entirely not about the apocalypse. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I think that's a... Anyway. Hi, Zadek. Sharon. Hey. Um, this is a question mostly for Sharon. It's kind of the same question, but in two parts. Um, what's the difference between a waking dream and just like a regular dream? And also, are you going to build that shrine? On what? Are you going to build the shrine for the Datuk? <laughs> Am I going to build the shrine? Oh. Oh. Yeah, I, this is, I mean, okay, this is deep, this is deep. Um, I say waking dream because I was awake. I was, I, I was sitting on the front step of my house um, and it was before I had to catch a plane to Vietnam. Uh, I remember that the image just coming uh, and I, it, it felt, I, I was awake, so I was, I was conscious, but it was not, it was very different from, I want to do something about this, I got to make art about this. Uh, it really was a receiving, is how I can describe it. 
uh, that's one of the things that I would say uh, is, is different, but also similar to dreams, is that uh, you are subject. <laughs> you, are, you are subject to the thing that is arriving. Um, yeah, and this question of whether uh, I'll build the shrine is, is uh, one thing uh, whether I feel I can. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, I, I do feel that I can build a shrine. Uh, I would like to um, because on the way to the airport, so this waking dream continued. On the way to the airport, had a series of images uh, in my head, like a film. It was like a film that I had never seen. Uh, and um, it was of somebody finding the right place to build it. And that dream, this waking dream, was that the, the end of that dream was this person uh, coming upon the place uh, where they knew they had to build the shrine. So the place, they, they, didn't, they didn't know why they were going, why they were getting, uh, why they were dreaming these, these dreams. But at the end, uh, they, they realized it was to bring them to this one particular place. And they knew that they had to build a shrine there. And, and I, remember, I remember this thought was that, uh, that moment of realization uh, for this person was incredibly lonely because nobody, you, it was, they knew they had to do it. They knew they had to build the shrine in that particular place, uh, but nobody else would, nobody, there's no explaining why. There's no justifying why to anybody else. And that was, that's why it was lonely. I have fantastic, fantastic discussion. I feel like it's like, whoa, this is so great. Um, I actually came here because I'm trying to figure out if these creatures of the near kingdom, if they are really all Datuk, okay? Because I, I think a lot about Datuk. I have the saying, I say, Jalan Jalan Chari Datuk. Okay. Um, it's really what I spend my time doing, so this is, Great, it was a great question, because I too was wondering if you would build a shrine, because I'm, I'm thinking that you have already built it, okay? and that that datuk came. So this brings me to just another question. Um, I think that the datuk is the product of Malay sensibilities to place, originally, okay? It's that indigenous, Malay ideas about place, and that's where the datuk comes from, and this relationship to nature. And you haven't had a chance to talk very much about how your um, illustrations come from the words, okay, and how they relate to the words. So I'll just, it's kind of maybe a difficult question, but would it, would your illustrations have been different if the stories had been written in Malay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I remember that when uh, when Sharon was working on the images, I was writing the Malay version. So, um, yeah. But this is a question for you. I don't. I, I'm not sure. Um, well, it's related to. Uh, we had this conversation a lot about. Oh, it should be two names on the cover, and I, I was I was adamant that it should just be Zidak's name on the cover. Uh, I think June also felt that it should be both our names on the cover. Uh, and also, Maple, Ami, and Roy felt that your name should be on. Oh, that's right. Yeah, but your name is in contract. But but the reason why I was so stubborn about about it because I is I truly felt that uh, without the stories, uh, there's no illustrations. So the stories are the source. Uh, of the images. So when I read Zirak's stories, then the images come. It's like a, it's really like a river. And it's, it's just a question of this body, uh, of it having enough stamina to complete all the, the images that are coming. So in that sense, it's very easy. Uh, uh, 
because um, I don't have to think, actually. Uh, you just have to, I mean, you, it's more receiving. I mean, there's craft, there's, you know, you edit things out and things like that. So it's not entirely like, oh, we're you know, it's not, it's not like that. Uh, um, but it is a different experience uh, from making art like this as opposed to uh, me constructing something. Uh, so that's an interesting, that's interesting thing <laughs> that I learned from making the art for this book. In terms of the Malay question, um, yeah, maybe maybe the images that come would have been different. I'm not sure. The yeah. texts are when I was writing the BM versions, they are in translation, so they are versions of the same animal, but completely different, some of them are completely different stories, so, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, so the idea was um, that if you read both, or if you knew how to read both, you would get two different experiences. Okay, this is for Zidek. Uh, you were a journalist for a short while. So I'm just curious if that experience, uh, how did that contribute to the process of making your art? Um, I, think two, I think it factored in two ways. I think it made my prose a lot cleaner. Because uh, in journalism, you don't want, you don't want extra words. Uh, or, or rather, I was. I think that was one of my takeaways. Um, oops. Oh well, I've been. So this is a page from uh, Malay Magic. Uh, the story in this section is uh, uh, is what is what the one of the animals in the book is is based on. Anyway, um, so I don't know. I I I think the tone is also. Of the of the text is quite journalistic, maybe, uh, but I don't know. Uh, does that answer your question? One last. Yeah. yeah. So this is not really a question. It's just a comment, which I think is interesting in the sense that, like, uh, we are here, and it's like ilham, which is you know like this inspiration, and it's also tied to sort of divinity in that like God is bringing this thing, and then you have like this waking dream. And then you felt like this call to do something, and I feel like it's there are a lot of this like prophets in the book who get like this the <laughs> download. Of, yeah, this download, <laughs> but also this feeling of also like loneliness. It's just like oh, like I have to do this, but I also don't really know where this is coming from and what what it means. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, um, Sharon and Zedek. Do you have any sort of things that you didn't get to? say that you want to well um we would like to well uh i want to start this slide because yeah. um kind of um uh where you're talking about zombies or whatever this is a page from the dungeons and dragons feed folio uh if you notice this is a penangalan so dungeons and dragons is a role-playing game where uh like nerds sit around the table and kill monsters in dungeons uh, and in one of the books, there is a Penangalan. Uh, so the, the book that I made uh, is very much modeled after monster manuals, uh, Dungeons and Dragons monster manuals. Uh, so that's what that's the that's that's what I want to talk about. No, this is a big thing. This is a big thing for Zidak. Uh, the, the monster manual. It's this is a f mm, this is like a new form of. Uh, Literature. <laughs> no, I, I was very gratified when, because the way people use this is that uh, you pick out a monster from the book and you put it for your players to like interact with at a, in a game. And something that, uh, like I think Shamila Gunnison uh, from BFM sort of said to us uh, when she was talk, talking to, the, to us about the book that really gratified me was like, oh, I started imagining these animals in my house, 
some, something to that effect. So that was like, oh, that's cool. That's exactly the way I want the, the thing to, to function. And, and of course you have um, uh, been involved in making a board game, Politico, for instance. Ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, Mankao and I make this, have this other project called uh, Thousand Thousand Islands, which is also a kind of a role-playing game thing. So we're going to show, just to close up, uh, show excerpts from this video called uh, Between Memory and Museum. And uh, it's produced by Tara Books. They are based in Chennai in India. Um, really amazing. You should check them out. But I, we wanted to show this video because I think it encapsulates what we're talking about, about the local uh, interfacing with institutions like museums. What does what sort of social function and cultural function does the museum play in a, in a community and what conversation are the artisans or the makers of the things that are going into the museum have with the museum? Karigori bhaji rande padari murbhatao Karigori bhaji rande padari murbhatao Saurengi ghi wala karkaye bode la dira Bhagavare ngalai dheere dheere A gone tribal artist imagined the gates of a museum as being guarded by a lion day and night held in place by elephants and decorated by deer. To him, the gate symbolizes what the museum holds within and what it keeps out. The Gons are a tribe from the central Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. Bhopal, its capital, is home to the Museum of Mankind. The sprawling museum showcases art and craft whose creativity draws on centuries of shared culture and aesthetics. Ironically, most of these communities have historically been considered uncultured, particularly tribals, known as Adivasis, or the original inhabitants of India. The museum facilitated an unusual encounter when it invited Tara Books to conduct a five-day workshop. And we'll show you a second excerpt. Gond art, like other community art practices, has its origins in decorative patterns and shared narratives. Over the last few decades, it has developed into a highly evolved aesthetic. The Gond artists at the workshop enjoyed reflecting on the museum as an institution and how it relates to their heritage. <laughs> तो ये लोहार जनजाति जो है अभी तक लोहा के काम कर रहा है करते करते थोड़ा देर के लिए लेट गई सो गया सो गया और ये काम कर ही रहे हैं तो ये सपना में देखता है कि साजा की पेड़ के नीचे हमारे आदिवासी आदि दादन के पुरखन की खजाना है को ये जो है पायल है ये पैसा है ये हवाल है ये कान की बाला है सारी चीजों को जो है बर्तन में रख के जो रखते थे ना उसको रखे हैं तो इसको आज संग्रहालय जो है सारी चीज को कलेक्शन करके कहाँ संग्रहालय में रखे हैं तो हमारे कहना मेरा सोच है कि हमारी ये सारी चीज देवी देवताओं के जो चीज है उसको हम साजा के नीचे पेड़ के नीचे ही दर्शाएं ताकि सब लोग देखें तो मोर जैसे नाचता ह� तो यहाँ पर उन लोगों को मैंने बता दिखा दिया है जो लोग खुश होकर देखते हैं इन चीजों को तो मोर एक राष्ट्रीय पक्षी है इसलिए मैंने यहाँ की चीजें भी एक राष्ट्र की संपत्ति है और गांव में खेती होती है एक खेत है खेत में बहुत अच्छी फसल उगी हुई तो बहुत सारी चिड़िया आती हैं बहुत से लोगों का जीवन जुड़ा होता है कल्चर रहता है मतलब वहाँ पे और चूहा जो रहता है जो बिल बना के जमीन में मतलब ग्राउंड ग्राउंडली जुड़ा होता है मतलब कल्चर से जुड़ा होता है वो तो माउस की एक आदत बहुत अच्छी है कि वो कुछ भी चीज को जो भी चीजें से उसको लगता है तो अपने होल में खट्टे करता है तो मैंने उस पेंटिंग में ये बताया है कि जितने भी कल्चरल चीजें 
वो उसको लाना है यहां वो कल्चर को एक लाइव करना है थैंक यू थैंक यू